Professor Dennis, you are the first non-medical person that I have interviewed in this way. You are an honorary fellow of the Royal College of Physicians, and we there isn't a day of the week that I personally, anyway, don't enjoy your masterpiece that you've done at the college and the sp really splendid college we enjoy so much. We like to think that it's has been of importance to you too in your career. Um, but I um, would be interested at the beginning to know what were the origins of your interests in, in architecture? When did you, when did the, the idea of such a career first come into your mind? I, it's not a very clear story. It certainly didn't come quickly. I know I remember leaving school and not knowing what I wanted to do. You were at rugby, and I was at rugby. I spent most of the time with Talbot Kelly in the art school, mm. and somebody had mentioned something about architecture, and it, it, it sounded attractive. It's about as vague as that. There was nothing in your background, the family or father or anything. Of this Always stuff. art. My yeah. mother was a very good musician, and my father's cousin, I think, was Leon Buxt, who did the. Mm. Um, decor for Diaghilev's ballet, yes. but, uh, but there's always been, and my grandfather was a very good painter in Australia, so it's always been mm. art, <laughs> yes. but not architecture particularly. And what tipped the balance, do you think, after you left school? Oh, once I understood vaguely what architecture was about, I never hesitated again. I mean, that was like a duck taken to water. And you went to the Architectural Association. I did. Um, somewhere in the very early part of that pe period, I mean, must have been fairly soon after you left school, I think in one of your papers you refer to the influence of the, the Le Corbusier Pavillon Suisse in Paris. That's right. Did you go to visit Paris when you were still a student? Oh, yes. I, I think as soon as I had read his book, uh, Vers in Architecture, it struck me that uh, I simply had to go and see what this man was actually building. And I went in about 1935, roughly around then, that period, I went straight to Paris and had a look at his buildings. I then began to study him in depth. I met him, of course, mm -hmm. later on. And he was without question for me, the greatest architect of this century, which is the title of his present exhibition at the Hayward Gallery, because yes. he's dead now. And of course, I got to know him a bit. Mm. But um, he certainly played a very important part in my architectural life as a mentor. But I did come, well, I always have admired him as an architect, but less and less as time went by was I interested in his urban theories about uh, ville radieuse and that kind of thing, because they struck me as being interesting polemically, but over the top. <laughs> uh, so that the Chandigarh work of his was not to your taste? Well, the idea of Chandigarh as, uh, in terms of its urban layout, is not to my taste, nor do I think it fits with, necessarily with India. But for me, with Corbusier, you have to make a sharp distinction between his theories about urban planning and his actual buildings, his actual pieces of architecture. And in Chandrigar, for instance, the, the courts of justice, and apart from his other buildings, show him as a superlative architect and one who really looked at Indian architecture, understood, for instance, the Red Fort in Delhi, I think, mm. and clearly he has transposed it into modern terms. So his buildings remain for me the, the great buildings of this century, without question. Not necessarily Chandigarh, but no. generally his <coughs> buildings. No. Um, his planning, <coughs> not so good. Um, <coughs> do I detect, <coughs> excuse me, um, a bias against the sort of 
what I would as a medical man call a biological aspect of architecture in, in regard to town planning, I mean to actual planning of more than a single building. Well, it's, it's almost what you, yes, I, I almost agree with what you say. What I uh, object to was any form of tabula rasa, of removing <coughs> the past of a city, mm -hmm. just flattening it. I mean, Hitler could do it, but he yeah. wasn't necessarily going to rebuild it. I suppose Napoleon did it to a Yes, but on the whole, and why the college is of supreme importance to me is it's the first study as a very strong reaction to this master plan mentality. And the College of Physicians, for instance, is, the f I think, the first important move in my world at any rate, which looked at a particular site in a particular place almost ecologically, and it, ga it, it, it derived its disposition and form not from a theoretical point mm. in general terms, but from a very specific point <coughs> for a specific lot of people in a specific place. And I think that's what makes for wonderful cities. It's not the great master plans, it's the, <coughs> uh, for instance, if you take um, Venice, which most people know, very, very few people can describe the buildings that they actually see. What they can describe are the intimate little places oh. that they pass through in Venice, the little piazza, the piazzettas, they may remember a bit of a building, but on the whole, they remember the little mm -hmm. spaces between buildings. Yes. And that was antithetic to what the great planners, the way they thought. Yes. And of course, coming back to the college, but just to be chronologically correct for a moment, the war in must have interrupted your career very considerably. And uh, oh, you yeah. were about 25 when it began. I can't remember it so long ago. Uh, and, ah. uh, and then you spent the whole of the war in, in, uh, in the engineers, Royal Engineers? Well, I started in the artillery. Oh. Because I had to, this was the days when they wanted to get people square pegs in square holes, or whatever the phrase is. Mm. And I remember going to be interviewed at the calling up office. And they said, well, what are you? And I said, I'm an architect. Ah, he said, and he wrote the letter A, and then he said artillery. <laughs> <laughs> but then I went to engineers, yeah. oh, yes. and I made airfields from D-Day onwards. So you really were in a very strong architectural role in in doing that. I mean, no, no. I don't mean in the design of uh, no, this was artistically really and so on. But you must have learned a lot about reinforced concrete and so on. No, these no. were these were um, these were uh, airfields where you flattened the ground. All only. Pretty well only. They oh. were for the fighters, and they had to be made very quickly. And they were. What they did do was to make me very conscious of contours of the earth and you know yes. walking the walking the yes. ground and so be, but they're, they're, they're really the opposite of architecture you you had already joined uh, a firm before with wells coats and so on tecton and drake was it before the war oh yes uh, my yes. first job was with wells coats whom i greatly admired and then with uh, lubetkin and tecton yes. uh, just joined them before the war and then and immediately afterwards, were you able to return to them? Yes, but yes. things have changed. It's very in, strange. In what way? I can't put my finger on it. I had changed. Yeah, I was sure seven years away, yeah. and whatever I may have enthused about um, before the war, and seven years mm. previously, my attitudes had profoundly changed. So that in the end, um, I set up with Drake on my own, yes. checked on and resolved, and then he died, and um, I then pursued a, a path that I happened to be interested in. Would you like to say a little more about that? I mean, that, um, because this is where you are carving your own career rather than uh, following an orthodox one of joining a partnership and so on. Yes, sir. Uh, um, I'm sorry, I'm not sure what the... What, what I'm really getting... To what extent, at this moment, you were really going for an architecture that you wished to do, not 
the architecture that a firm might be com yes, commissioned to uh, the, the, undertake. That's right, but the, the firms, of course, were dominated by two um, important architects, Wells Coates yes. um, and Lubetkin in the case of Tecton. But I found that I suppose I was a slow developer due to the war, and I began thinking about architecture in a different way, which doesn't mean that I turned my back on the lessons that I had absorbed. Mm. But well over, the, over and above either Wells Coates or Tecton was, my, was the great mentor, and that was always Corbusier. Yes. And both these offices that I went to were the nearest I could get to him in England. Mm. Uh, but he <coughs> remained for a long time uh, the dominant influence. Mm. And then I began to, like all young, younger people, they climb up on other people's shoulders and then they, they feel fledged to get off on their own which is roughly what happened to me. Did you travel around a fair amount in this time? Yes. I mean, uh, abroad? And yes. Uh, yeah. I, I traveled into America mm. and Europe, not the Far East till very much later. Uh, and you had one academic year, didn't you? Or was it full-time, or was it a, an appointment at Leeds as a... Well, Hoffman... Uh, Hoffman Wood... Uh, I think it was here. Uh, emeritus. Yes. Yes. And you en did you enjoy that? I mean, no, uh, I'm not an academic. No, I wondered if it was. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I do mm. like uh, talking and having seminars with young people, but mm. as a sort of academic teacher, it's not my scene at all. And certainly not as an academic architect, I suppose. No, no, no. no. Yeah. I'm a practitioner yes, yes. first and foremost. I, I, I try and keep abreast of the so-called theories, but. I'm really a practitioner and, and very pleased to be one. Mm. Before you came to, to the uh, college, um, you had done quite a number of important uh, works. So there were these flats in St. James, weren't there? Yes. Um, was that one of the earliest, more or less independent pieces of work? Yes, you? I think it's one of the very early ones. I think it is, yes. That was for a very, very rich man. <laughs> but even then, uh, you're forced to commit yourself, aren't you? I mean, oh, the fact yes. that he's very rich and you might be able to <laughs> modify it or use the best materials or something. Well, I was very pleased because now you've reminded me of something. At that moment, I was working in St. James's Place for this very, very rich man <laughs> we're talking about. But I was also working in the bombed out, depressed areas of Bethnal Green. Yes, where I on did housing was on that? On what they called yeah. housing in those days. And, and <coughs> so I wouldn't like it to be thought that I only worked for exclusively rich clients, because I don't. No, no, I wasn't going to accuse <laughs> you of that. <laughs> I imagine that you would accept any challenge, regardless, architectural challenge, regardless of the other, certainly regardless of the financial implications. Yeah. Although, of course, you, you have to be sure of your clients that can carry it through. That's right, you do. And you have occasionally, I think, had disappointments in that way. Oh, lots. Yes. Lots of disappointments. When you must have done a huge amount of work and then it's uh, never come to yes. fruition. Yes, I mean, you win some and you lose mm. some. Yes, you do. It if we, uh, we're, I'm jumping quite a bit, but of course, uh, my major interest this morning is really in regard to your, to the College of Physicians. Uh, I'm sure that posterity would be very interested to know the details of how you came to be to know about the, the pro project at all and how you came to apply to, to be considered as mm. the architect for the scheme and, and the interview and so on. Would you like to <coughs> talk in some detail about this because I'm sure this is a great interest for the records of the college. Yes, well it's going back to 1958 yes. which is nearly 30 years. <coughs> it's very vivid. I got a letter, I think, from Bumford, Dr. Mm -hmm. Bumford, or it may have been Robert Platt, I can't remember, simply saying the college are considering uh, building another 
<coughs> college on a site which was not dis not specified where oh. it was, and if I was interested, would I send particulars of what I'd done? And I wrote back and said, of course I was interested, and I sent what particulars I had. And then I was asked to attend the famous interview, which took place in Smirk's building in the census room, overlooking Trafalgar Square and facing South Africa House. Oh. I was facing South Africa oh. House. The interviewers had their back to the light. I don't recall precisely who they were. Certainly Robert Platt. And Dick Bomford, I suppose. Dick Bomford, <coughs> I think Evans, not sure. Lord, yes, Lord Evans. Mm. Uh, Charles Dodds, yes. I think. Baldero, mm. I think. As registrar then. Yes, yes you know better than I yes. do. And uh, they asked me, and it was a good interview. I didn't think there was any, I didn't take it all that seriously because I didn't think I had a chance of getting the job anyhow. But there was um, a very interesting moment when I was invited to stand up, walk to the window and look across Trafalgar Square at South Africa House, which is Herbert Baker's building, uh, which is, I suppose you call it, sort of neoclassical mm. kind, not a building that I admire at all. And I was asked if I were given the job, would I do a building something like that? To which I unhesitantly said no. And I didn't elaborate. The interview uh, closed, as far as I remember, more or less on that note. Had you ascertained where the building was going to be at this stage? I'm not quite clear. There was some um, confidentiality mm -hmm. about where the building was to be. I think I probably, in confidence, would have been told. I'm not sure. I can't quite a, remember there that. There was a difficulty because, of course, Commissia has to be carried along and Commissia oh, yes. might have had other views. Absolutely. Yes. I mean, I don't think, mm. even if I was told, that I was told that it was absolutely mm. firm, but it yes. might have been in Regent's Park with the yes. uh, Nash Terraces. And um, now that was the interview. And I remember getting the letter saying that we've decided to give you the commission. Uh, would I come along for early meetings? And I suppose it's one of those uh, memorable moments in one's life. There are always some which are absolutely unforgettable. I was overjoyed and slightly frightened. Um, apprehensive, at any rate. But the next episode after that, I think there were meetings, but the most talking of being frightened, frightening meeting that I went to was that Robert Platt asked me put myself in the gallery of the library in Smirk's building and attend mm. the commission so that I could observe, yes. you know, how it went. So I stood alone in the gallery looking down on these eminent physicians and uh, after about 25 minutes I absolutely panicked, left and wandered around Trafalgar Square. Robert Platt asked me what did I think of his speech afterwards and I had to confess that I, I, I didn't hear it all. So he sent me a copy. <laughs> I certainly remember that. And I, I panicked because I didn't really see quite how modern architecture and those eminent physicians would oh. ever... This is a very important point, by the way. Very because yeah. it, 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 it's a portrait of, a, of, of an act of immense trust mm. by the college. There's no doubt in retrospect in my mind, with one or two notable exceptions, that nobody, and that goes for today too, mm. particularly likes modern architecture. Some of them are positively hostile to mm. it, others <coughs> not so strong, but modern architecture would be the last thing they would want for their new college. And um, I sensed and later discovered that the college had been advised by Sir John Summerson 
that if they were to build for tomorrow, then they must have an architect who was prepared to do out of today mm. what, ar <coughs> what architects of the past would have done had they been in our situation sort of thing. And he said, you must have a modern building, like it or not. And he further advised them that he didn't think that that was incompatible with Nash. This was to be a long mm. journey, in fact, mm. and a lot of debate surrounding it in the college and out of the college. And in fact, it still continues. Yes, <laughs> to some extent. To some extent, yes. Uh, I think that battle has been won, but of course details of the... And of course getting the whole precinct, more, which we'll come to later perhaps. That's much later. Uh, it's so much later, but nevertheless has, has made a, a difference to the attitude to the whole, the whole c c complex. Yes, I mean mm. I have... You see, if I had to sort of... Apart from relationships with uh, Robert Platt, which was quite exceptional, mm and Dick Bumford, both one, the former, immense courage to steer the commissioner through very difficult waters, <coughs> yes. and absolute confidence. Whether he actually had it or not, another matter, but he certainly... But he wasn't never afraid of taking the responsibility at no. all. And, and he handled it in, a, in a, a wonderful way. But the more interesting no, as interesting episode which touches me deeply is um, Sir Charles Dodds because he was to become president when the Queen opened the building. Yes. And I remember walking up the stairs on that occasion with his hands holding the paper, shaking and trembling with nerves. Mm, yes. I could see him vividly. Now, Dodds was a funny man. I'm talking now as the architect. But an interesting man, yes. and never disguised his dislike of modern architecture. At any meeting he would say, well, I really don't like modern architecture. But he particularly disliked the worst elevation of the building. But nevertheless, he, he didn't try and frustrate the college's wishes to get on with it. He simply mm. established his point of view. Now, the most touching thing about him is a letter which he wrote and which I treasure, in, uh, which was written a few days, probably after the opening of the college with the Queen, uh, when he wrote to Robert and said, I have never disguised my apprehension at the course you embarked on, nor indeed did I think I would ever like the building. But I'm bound to say, it was very moving. Yes, that, and it's a very moving thing to to write. Yes, uh, a, a, it is a letter. very typical of the man. If I'm I from yes. what I know Oh, he's a remarkable him. man. When I say yes. he's funny, it is that when you meet him. But he was a great traditionalist. He hadn't yes. perhaps got a great deal of tradition in his sort of family background and so on. And he was very anxious to have it. That's right. He wanted yeah. um, a sculpture, mm. the insignia of the royal. You know, yes. A lot of people, quite mm. understandably, said, "Well." It, when they saw the designs, it doesn't look like a college because their their vision of a college would have been something that they knew about, like a I pedimented think. front yes, of smirk exactly. or something yes, like yes. that. So um, uh, that touched me very. But that's the tip of an iceberg of many fascinating comments which were made by the committee, which Robert Platt chose the building committee. I mean, they were. I've got a list of them. Newman, yes. Uh, well, some mm. we've mentioned. E Evans we've mentioned. Yes. Hunter, Leatham, Ellis, or was it Elliot? I can't remember. Ellis, I think. Ellis, uh, Wilson, of course, at mm. one point yes. because he yes. he was the benefactor, and um, there are others. I wouldn't mm. like to omit their names, so we may have to add their names in afterwards yes. because they're yes. all rather important. I mean, it has to be remembered when the, at the time I was appointed, the houses in Albany Terrace, or Albany Street. I Albany think. Street, yes. Yes, the terrace of houses well, in Albany yes. Street were not to be pulled down. 
And it, it's even the ones at the no, no, the last yeah. four, the last few next mm. to number eight mm. were to stay, and this was a very, in, to me, a very inhibiting issue, mm. um, and it's largely due, in fact, I think, to Boldero, that in the end, the decision was made that they all had to come down. Mm. It was a very mm. important uh, move. Yes, he was another man who was not afraid to not to a take bit. responsibility. No, not a bit. Yeah. And Cullinan. He was there, too. Uh, I th yes. And whose son... And whose son, of course, was to join you. In he fact, I met me. you through your That's right. advice to uh, employ him. And at one he stage. has become, uh, for his yeah. generation, a, you know, a very, yes. very important an architect. Extremely delightful person. And a delightful person, a great friend of mine. The Summary's house itself um, was still standing at this point. Summary's house was standing at 45 degree, d 45 <laughs> line on the corner. And in Summerson's description of Georgian London, I think he dismisses it as a sort of building that was put up for superannuated governesses yes. uh, who would look after the children <laughs> of the nobility or the military uh, in Nash's grand plan. But he, he didn't think there was any point in, in keeping it, and nor did the Royal Fine Art Commission. Now, that is something that couldn't happen today. England has become so entrenched in mm -hmm. sloppy nostalgia with the prince banging on left, right, and centre, you know, mm. that no way would you get that building, inferior though it was, pulled down today. I, doubt I mean, it was merely compatible with his general plan, really, wasn't it? It and, wasn't very and, it, it and, wasn't I mean, it, otherwise, it was just the bare essentials, a barracks, really, for this... For this oh, the great terraces, were those... Well, the terraces were fine, but, this but particular Nash himself, at, at, with somebody's house, was only a... It was, it was a servant's annex. Almost. That's right. Yes. But the fuss that would be d made today would be nobody's would, would it? Would be mm. nobody's. You wouldn't, mm. uh, wouldn't get, get it down. down. Not a hope. And you wouldn't get college physicians up either. I doubt. The rot has set mm. in. <laughs> uh, I, I, I would like to talk a little more <laughs> about this in a way. But in the course of building the, of, the, of the designs you produced and the model and so on, um, did you get detailed opposition from the College Building Committee, or were they, or was it essentially fairly plain sailing within the college? Oh no, there was. A, I, I mean, I, I've got notes here, but I, I can recall. Um, well, Dodds, we've discussed. Yes, uh, yes. He thought it was awful. The West Front didn't look like a college. Uh, Wilson thought it was good function there, mm. and then an awful entrance, he thought, and hated the roofscape on the top, and said the whole thing looked like a school. Um, there, I think Evans thought the treatment of the sensor, which is a difficult problem, because yes. I had to incorporate mm. the panelling yes. from Hook's original, which was rescued from London, yes. Fire of London. And the fenestration, therefore, had to be integrated with the panelling in the new room. And I, I, mean, mm -hmm. I took a lot of trouble with that. But nevertheless, Evans found it aggressive, a little bit. Not very. Mm. But all these comments, and there were many more, uh, nearly always acknowledged that the arrangement of the different rooms, the planning, was good. So that was a rather strong card in my hand. So we were really left with matters of aesthetics, where they were on less good ground, having decided they must mm. have a modern building, albeit not liking modern <coughs> architecture. I mean, one practical point as Harveyan librarian, uh, to me it's absolutely almost miraculous how you have so much book space in the main library with so small windows from the inside and yet giving such a lot of light I yeah. mean, these very narrow windows in, are very effective in providing enough light. Yeah. From outside, they hardly seem to be windows at all. No, well, this, this touches on um, the sort of strategy of the design, mm. which is very, even now, I think it was, it was a good move. Mm. And I have to explain this because Please. the little windows are all part of a, of a syndrome. The natural instinct, when given this commission with a big frontage to, to the park, and in fact the first designs did exactly what I'm going to describe, 
uh, would be to put the main suite of rooms parallel with the road and mm. overlooking the park. Mm. And I studied the park for rejecting this rather carefully, and I thought it's the scruffy end of the park anyhow. Mm. Not mm. a great view, certainly not in winter. Very noisy from traffic, mm. particularly that. And missing, if you put a building across the front, a very important strategic move in the arrangement of the college, which proved to be dead right when we come to talk about the precinct, mm. which was to turn the whole building at right angles to the park with a blank face, very unexpected, mm. blank face to the park, to have the lecture hall low-lying and forming a court with the Nash terraces forming the third and fourth side of the court. Mm. And I believe this was the most important oh. part of the design. So coming back to your small windows, it would be unthinkable after that to have large windows in the right. library. <coughs> yes. They were only ever put there to remind fellows during the long debates, whether it was raining or sunny, some mm. little relief to the eyes. Yes but no more. This was to be uh, almost um, monastic. But they're wonderfully successful, actually, in, pr in admitting light. Yes, they do, yes. but, uh, but uh, it's not, mm. you're not exposed. Uh, no. And that's deliberate. Mm. You are exposed when it comes to the court, where the largest windows that can be manufactured in one pane of glass have mm. been used, so that the court and Nash's buildings beyond are totally a part of your experience when you're walking up the staircase in the main building. I, re I seem to remember your quoting once, form follows function, is that correct? Well, that's and not me. Uh, that's not you. No. But you, you, you're quoting somebody else then, but you, you, you use the phrase. Yes. And did you, um, I mean, when you witnessed the commissia at, uh, in Smirk's old building, you were... Uh, you could hardly be aware that there was any sort of ceremonial, I imagine. I mean, the procession in was, was a shuffling thing from the next room. Mm. Uh, and yet in the college, you have given us this magnificent uh, sweeping uh, sort of clockwise yes. processional route, which yes. is, uh, gives such a tremendous dignity to the to ceremonial in the yes. college. Well, that I think probably was inspired by two things about the college. First of all, the spirit which hovers around the whole building, which is Harvey, mm. and Harvey's portrait. And since Harvey, by every Harvey in oration, is commemorated, patron saint, yes. commemorated. and um, I began to look into what Harvey stood for not medically, mm. that I wouldn't be capable of. And uh, I became aware that his teacher, whose name I can't remember, in 17th century in Padua, yes. would have come from the same place the tablets come mm. from, which are the, the yes. anatomical tablets come from. But his great feeling about the college was that, yes, science was important, but then so was uh, convivial and congenial meeting of fellows mm. and mm. that was one part of the puzzle. The other part of the puzzle was the scrutiny which I had experienced in the censor's room and since the censor room had the hook panelling in it and was a relic of the past, the spiral movement of the staircase as you go up the building devolves round the sensor, if you picture it in your mind, mm -hmm. and then turns you onto an axis facing Harvey. Yes, yes. And uh, if you can call that an anatomy procession, that's <laughs> what it's really about. Meanwhile, yes. of course, you are aware of the Nash terraces over the, over the other side, beyond the boundary. Yes. Of course, that vision of the, of the St. Andrew's Place 
through those marvellous windows in the hall and so on mm. and up the stairs is, is, it's, it's good. is, is really tremendous. Uh, it is good. And uh, I think, you see, the other thing is when I watched uh, physicians um, during their meetings, the big meetings, you see somebody on a landing with a glass of sherry in one hand mm. talking to somebody <coughs> on the half landing of the stairs. I mean, everybody is mm. exchanging uh, pleasantries, possibly even serious matters, but instead of it being done in a rather stiff way, it's done in a mm. congenial way. And I was, of course, well aware that Robert Platt often used the word democratic, mm. and um, that he wanted to think of the college as a democratic organization. And if you compare the entrances, which cost, which caused so much criticism between, say, Smirk's entrance, mm. which was neoclassical, formal, pedimented, and columned. That's not exactly inviting you to come in. It's almost saying this is an exclusive society, keep mm. out. It was very forbidding, yes. And uh, the college, on the other hand, is tries to be inviting, tries to make uh, younger members feel uh, not too uncomfortable. But this was the great revolution, not really, of Robert Platt's time. Absolutely. Uh, <coughs> and, and it was the move to the college you created which, I suppose, really enabled this to happen. It could never have happened in the old college. It couldn't probably have happened in the same degree if, they, if we had taken some existing building, some large existing building after the war mm. in the Harley Street area. Yes, I, I think it's very mm. kind what you're saying, but in the end, I, I mean, I think it's true too, but yeah. only partly true. I would, I don't really believe that the the architecture alone can make this change. No, it, it, it was a change of ethos. Uh, I'm not trying to imply it was alone. No, it simply married most beautifully with Robert Platt's oh, ideas yes. for this democracy of the yeah. college. A yeah. totally changed attitude. Yeah. In the old days, you know, you were. Well, the library wasn't used. If you did, you sought permission, and it wasn't open, yes. and that sort of thing. Well, I found uh, Robert very inspiring. Yes, he was a, uh, a really inspiring man to work for, and Dick Bumford was an incredibly mm. good midwife. If, I, if yes. I'm sure you wouldn't mind, no. he wouldn't mind me saying no, that. I knew got to know him very, very well, mm. and I have the highest regard for him. He midwifed that building yes. right the way through. Oh, surely. Mm. Um, and of course, strangely, I mean, in a way, his successor, Nigel Cumpston, was to be the midwife of the precinct. Uh, Absolutely. I mean, yes. uh, uh, I'd often, uh, you know, Nigel and I got on extremely well, and I said, you know, that brick wall that separates you is not a natural boundary. The real boundary is on the other side. And I was reading not so long ago Robert Platt's Lineker lecture, in mm -hmm. which. Uh, he said the college isn't only about physicians, it's also about um, allied disciplines like radiology and, and other things which you know more about than I do, and w one of which was, of course, never heard of in those days, which was community medicine. Yes. So that um, it was in the air mm. that really you build a building, you have lecture hall facilities, dining hall facilities, library facilities, and yet there are lots of little medical institutions which should do their work near such facilities. And yes. So the obvious yes. thing was to make a precinct. And that started getting underway in about the beginning of the 80s. I think, yes. 81, yes. 82. It wasn't, a, it wasn't a strong possibility till about 83, I think. I mean, there were so many difficulties. Oh, it's, it's I mean, taken yes. seven years to yes. get a path done. Yeah. Because you have the objections from the Crown Estate paving, from Camden, mm. GLC, historic buildings, you name them, they've all got some objection to something. Mm. But in the end, it's there, and that's what matters. Yes. <laughs> um, you touch on a point which, to a non-architect, seems such a great constraint in architecture, uh, and that is what you are permitted to do by these partly self-appointed or bodies or governmental or semi-governmental mm. bodies in regard mm. to planning mm. and, and fine arts. Mm. Um, these are 
These must be incredibly frustrating to somebody who is essentially a creative artist in, in architecture. Well, this, this is so, but you see why the college plays such an immensely warm part in my life and a very important part is the, the, after the criticisms uh, had been made about the design and I was able to answer them, not answer them, reply to them. Oh. I don't suppose I changed their minds much, but I told the building committee, it's no use me going from here onwards to try and get this building through the Fine Art Commission, the GLC, House of Commons, there had been an act oh. to get uh -huh. passed in the, in the government, unless you are unanimous, this is a rather important issue, in your approval, mm -hmm. whatever reservations, you either back it mm -hmm. or you don't. I can't go in fighting if I feel behind no, me. Sure uh, yeah. And the behavior of the college was exemplary. Yeah. Whatever their private feelings, Robert Platt gave a speech at Commissioner and said precisely this, you may not like this building, you may not like modern architecture or whatever, if you feel that way, then I think he said, try and see your way to abstaining in the voting, mm. but don't vote again, or something like yes, that. Yes. And there was that historic occasion when, in fact, the voting was what they call NEMCOM. Yes. There was no opposition at all. Really? Yeah. Now, when you've got a body like the college mm. behind you, uh, you will make short shrift to the Royal mm. Fine Art Commission and all the rest of them. I mean, one has mm. such a feeling of yeah. support there of willing the building mm. forward. And it counts for something that the college history goes back nearly 500 years. Exactly. I mean, so uh, that uh, yeah. the college really took the, mm. took the responsibility. Took the work, yes. And uh, it made my life mm. certainly easier, but much pleasanter. And we did have uh, difficulties. There's no doubt the Royal Fine Art Commission niggled away, but we didn't mm. take much notice. But the precinct, funnily enough, caused an awful lot of problems. Yes, partly because uh, I think the Crown Estate people gave permission which they were not entitled to give. And somebody spotted this. All sorts so of complications, yeah. yes. However, the end result is, is couldn't be more pleasing and it's in nice every now. way. Yes. Um, a, a second constraint we've touched on to some extent, and this is, of course, the client and, and to what extent the client's practical needs. We've talked about the, the main purposes of the college, the lectures, the teaching, the conviviality, if you like, and democracy. But of course, there's always a, a business section of the college. Mm. Um, and was that a problem with the, uh, from a, you and the Well, college? I don't think it's as good as it should be. Um, but, but the constraint, one of the constraints is that in a way, the site isn't over big for what no, the college no. needs to do. Mm -hmm. I tried to build in places where you can add to it, which is in the car park area. Yes, where we're rather hoping to do so. Exactly, yes. you can add a bit, but it's not a big site. And uh, also there was the question of money. And um, an architect has to decide, you know, how to distribute mm. in his own field what money is available. And I think some of the uh, offices are probably a bit small, I don't know. I, I don't think that would be a criticism really? I would make. I think we want everybody, every business always needs more offices. Yes. And uh, at the time that you built this, the college had nothing like the ambitions that it now has. No. Um, well, I, I'm glad to hear that, but I mean, it is, there are bits that I would do better. If, there, if, I, if I were to make a, a criticism, yes, do. and I'm not sure that it's how, how valid it is in the time in which you were doing this, mm. it's the um, accessibility for disabled people. And, yes. And that really has been a problem. Well, uh, I mean, there are so many little, little steps and so Well, we put so in, of course, a disabled I know it's now been now. Uh, um, um, corrected to some extent. Well, I think attitudes to the disabled have really revolutionized since that building mm. went up. I'm not offering this as an excuse. One ought to have anticipated it, I suppose. But when I did the National Theatre, I mean, this was nothing compared to the problems I had and the yes. complaints I had in the National Theatre. Because the disabled people now, and I, they have my sympathy, 
uh, want. They don't just want to go and sit and be able to see the theatre. They want to get on the stage and act. I mean, it's a very, very positive, yes. militant attitude, yes. which has my great sympathy. But you can't... You can't allow for everything. You can't allow for everything. Yeah. I mean, a wheelchair, for instance, in an aisle in a theatre, if there was a fire, mm. would be a hazard to a thousand people. Yes. Uh, so that it's a very tricky mm. area, but it didn't, uh, it wasn't resolved uh, at the beginning with the college. It, it could have been. Perhaps we didn't think about it hard enough, but anyhow, how it now has been. Not particularly elegantly, but at least it has been. No, solved. I think the, the problem was compounded by the fact that some of the nice little features and the little stairways and steps and things, which, which Mm. aesthetically add to the pleasure were ma just made it that much more difficult to yes. manhandle somebody in a wheelchair around the place. I, I accept this. Mm. Mm. Um, the, a third constraint, I'm the son of an engineer, I got always baffled by the, the engineering side, I mean the actual weights, stresses, materials and so on. Mm -hmm. And you have this huge sort of cantilevered front of an extremely heavy library in our case mm -hmm. and so on. These must have, was this not a, a major problem to you? Or is it, well, had you already done things that were, that had solved the, these problems for you? I hadn't, but these points that you're making are in the nature of reinforced concrete. It is in the nature of that material that you can do that sort of thing. That it doesn't necessarily follow that you should do that sort of thing, and this is a very compelling reason for doing so. Now, the thinking behind that in the college was to have a very easy entrance with no clutter. So the front part of the building is supported by only three columns, mm. uh, like a like a tripod almost yes. with the front leg mm. there, and the, and the rest is mm. is well back into the building. So there's freedom of movement for both pedestrian and even cars to draw mm. up and get under cover in in inclement weather. I think it was the right decision. It also is part of a more romantic concept because the building has two floors superimposed over a blue brick floor, you know, if mm. you think about it. Mm. And the important rooms like the library, the upper hall and the dining room are double volume rooms sitting over a single story, free form, blue brick yes. arrangement, much, much looser. And the idea of that is to say, this is the architect speaking, mm. I'm expressing on the upper two floors in mosaic, which is both outside the building and inside the building, the permanent fixed features of the college, the library, mm. the census room, and the dining room, although that has a hydraulic wall to make it bigger mm. or smaller. Below that, you, you, as the client, are free, when I'm dead and gone, to add bits Wherever we have Where blue bricks. Wherever you have blue bricks, yes. <laughs> so that it, the, the main part has to poise yes. over that elegantly. Yes. So we can't have a lot of columns getting in the way. It's got yeah. to be free and the air's got to separate the two. So that's part of the romantic view of it. Mm. Yeah. No, well, that's, of course, the great excitement of the, of the building to, a <coughs> to those of us who have the privilege of being there nearly all the time. It is this incredible sense of light and space um, the movement even of large groups of people, two or three hundred, is, is easily encompassed. I mean, it never feels that you are being, uh, you never feel stressed with... Uh, well, I'm delighted to hear that. Yeah. I think it does work well mm. from that point of view. I mean, it's, I've been there when there are a thousand people there and it's... Yes, it, it can happen. It I can mean, happen. Yes. So, I'd like to think that the building, in that sense, has slightly shifted the focus from being a very learned society to being a world mm. influence for I don't think there's any doubt about that, it, uh, and I'm sure that having this home has made a tremendous difference. I think difference. It, it must have helped. Yes. Mm. Come back to one little quibble again. Yes. Um, yeah. And this is the mosaic you mentioned. It's simply lovely on the inside, and it's lovely to look at on the outside, but it did, it did lead to some very serious problems, didn't it? It did. 
uh, and the college were extremely good about it. The, the problem is to do with um, the expansion and contraction of concrete between mm. hot and cold temperatures where you get cracks, fair cracks. They're not dangerous cracks. Yeah. They're simply cracks in the fabric have nothing to do with the safety of the building uh, at all. But you've got a close-fitting corset on it. Or you've got a, a skin. Skin, yeah. And there were fractures on that skin. Mm. And um, uh, these appeared, I suppose, in the, was it the 80s? 70s, I would think, eight, late 70s. We perhaps. didn't do the mosaicing. Uh, was it? Well, it's about four years, five years ago, isn't it, that we so did it's 82. Them. Yes, 82, yes. perhaps. Uh, well, in that period of 25 years, there's, there's been very, very slight mm. movements of, of expansion, which I think are now over. Mm. But they were, they're not serious structurally, they're just unsightly. But lumps could fall off, of course. No. no? I, well, I think a couple fell off. Nothing, <laughs> nothing, nothing to be alarmed about. No. A couple of inch by inch mosaics, not anything yeah. to write home about. But perhaps it was not over alarmed, but it, uh, but you had the feeling, perhaps as a ex dermatologist, that the skin there was overstretched. <laughs> overstretched, and well, uh, I think that's true. But it's it's pretty. been done at a cost, mm. I know. But then, you know, the building's got to be. But up. of course, it then wears so beautifully, weathers so nicely, and wash it, and, and washes mean. so perfectly, yes. and so on. Um, it does look good now. Mm. It still looks very good. Now, uh, perhaps, if I may, I'd take you away from the college, because mm. at least two other major buildings I would like to, you to talk about a little. One is the East Anglian University, which was a very big complex indeed, mm. and the other, of course, the National Theatre, and mm. perhaps more on the latter than the former. But, but the East Anglian University was, was a building of a, really, a total university, was it not? And yes. I mean, as a whole, well, as a from the beginning. Yeah, mm -hmm. not realised mm -hmm. fully, but part, uh, yes, mm -hmm. it was laid out as a complete one of the, I think there were seven or eight new universities, and this yes. is one of them, yes. in Norwich, outside Norwich. Mm. Yes, it's a great, a great site, I mean, moderately yes. level, but were just interesting enough to be. Well, quite a slope, mm -hmm. down, to a, down to the River Yar. Uh -huh. Yes. But you were then applying, what, what would I, I, my ignorance, very much this sort of horizontal strata yes. in, in, in the, um, and with walkways and so on. Yes. Which yes. Was that an important preliminary to, to the commission for doing the National Theatre? Not as important as the college. No, really? No. The college um, has the seeds, if I can put it that mm. way, of, of a lot of aspects of the National Theatre. For instance, the when you walk up the staircase in the college and look out to what I call the fourth wall, which is mm. the Nash Terraces, that's a parallel act taken in the theatre. When you look out of the theatre and you see uh, the King's Reach bend in that river, which mm. goes from St Paul's right back to Waterloo Bridge, so that the what Nash is yeah. to the college, that aspect of the City of London is to the whole audience of the National Theatre. And Theater. of course with uh, some, um, Somerset House, and with Somerset, as part of it. All part of mm. it. I mean, it. It is the relationship of a building to the existing city beyond, and not coming back to the beginning of our conversation, or rather it is antithetic to pulling flat areas down and doing it tabula rasa. It, yes. it is making what exists of the past part of the present. Mm. And that is very strong in my gut, that feeling. Yes. Uh, which is why, for instance, the census room is welcomed by me as part of the past. So if you look very carefully at it, and this is really for architectural people, I suppose, more than they people, it has not been put back exactly as Hook, Hook had done it. You'll find little windows in the corners exactly, which just ventilated. As in the yes. So it's not trying to say I'm reproducing no. Hook or Wren or whoever it was. I'm reinterpreting it. And the past is always 
evident. Mm. And that goes for the City of London and the theatre. So, so that much of the feeling, I think, uh, of the theatre comes from the college, but it's a rather more complicated... And, it must um, have been immensely complicated. And politically uh, yes. horrific yes. experience to yes. have had to cope with it. But the design part emanates from the college. Mm. And this I've acknowledged on many occasions. It must have been an extremely exciting commission, but an immensely demanding one. Um, were you pulled hither and thither by yes, the... Yeah. like a football, kicked everywhere. <laughs> but that is the role of an architect, as far as I could make out. Were you always commissioned to create sort of at least three theatres within the complex? No. No, that was... Everything started in the usual way in England. Let's have value for money. One theatre that could that can do everything. Well, you see, you can't turn a swan into a goose. Yep. And that took months to argue that one out. And then uh, questions were asked as to what is the nature of tomorrow's theatre, which is the story of the Olivier Theatre. Yes. It'll be 18 next month, or this month. And that took ages to resolve. But there we are, we did it. Did Olivier himself get involved in that? Oh, very much. He yes, was chairman uh, of the building yes, committee. Yes, he really was the... So he would welcome enormously, I imagine, the, the concept of that Olivier Theatre with yes, almost he, in the round. But he said he did. But the mm. point about Olivier is that he could act Hamlet in here if he had to. Yes. But he doesn't need a theatre. <laughs> <laughs> He's a creature of theatre and could act mm. anywhere. But mm. he was very supportive mm. at the end, though not without a lot of difficulties. Um, I noticed in your who's who, I imagine, or somewhere where I've... You've, You've been at least assessor for a number of interesting things abroad in mm. Bulgaria, oddly enough. Yeah, they yeah. like me in Bulgaria. Yes. <laughs> I go next, this year. What did you do there? Was that, was that an opera house? No, no that no. was Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia was yeah. the opera house. That was an opera house for Belgrade. Well, my wife comes from Belgrade. And, uh, yes, yeah. well, this was the mm. new opera house, mm. and it never got built. No. It was won by two young Danish architects. Very, very good design. But that went down. I'm what did you do in Bulgaria? Was it Sofia? No, no, oh. I have. I, no. I'm. No, no, they, no. That was assessing somebody else's work, was it? Uh, Yugoslavia was the opera, opera house. house. Yes, but in Bulgaria. Bulgaria, no. I, um, Bulgaria, for some reason, wants to become a, a, a kind of a centre for architecture, and so mm. they invite me. Right, that's turn as, as I'm being hurried to finish. The, your Israeli one was a synagogue, isn't it? Yes. Right? Yes. That must also have been a great excitement and challenge. Well, amazing working with people like Teddy Collick. It was not built. Yes. Not built? No, it never will be. No? It took no. me three years to design it, but it's a casual day. Well, well, I'm I sorry think. to hear it. <laughs> I, I have to complete this and say how immensely grateful I am, and the college surely will be, uh, for what you've said this morning. And it will be turning again and again, I think, to this record of what was quite the most important event for the college in this century.